Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast, providing quick and innovative ways to make the absolute most out of your research time and creative ideas for sharing and displaying your family history. I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello and welcome to the Genealogy Gems podcast episode for April 26th, 2012. Well, the big news, which just kind of trumps everything else, is that Ancestry.com has acquired Archives.com. And this was just released on April 25th of 2012 by Ancestry.com in a press release. You know, Archives.com has been kind of hovering around in the background, and they really kind of came on to the main genealogy stage at the Roots Tech 2012 conference this year. And it's no surprise that uh, Ancestry got their eye on them very quickly. They've been a key player in the 1940 census rollout, partnering together with National Archives. Um, so it's really not surprising that Ancestry wanted to get their hands on Archives.com. As Ancestry announced this acquisition, um, I received the press release along with a kind of an initial summary by Tim Sullivan, the CEO of Ancestry, giving a little more background on the acquisition. And he said, in some ways, we view our deal with archives.com as a coming of age moment for the online family history category. We very much view the acquisition of archives.com as a way for us to accelerate our strategy of serving multiple customer segments with well-differentiated offerings. I want to emphasize that our plan is to keep archives.com as a distinct brand and site, to continue to nurture its existing partnerships, and to continue to invest in new content, product, and technology. Well, it's clear now that archives.com considered its customer segment to be the family history newbies, people who are new to family history, who don't want to shell out the full cost of Ancestry's website. And so they have an offering that is much more affordable and emphasizes what I kind of consider to be more commonly known records. They link to a lot of records that are available for free in other places on the web, and they're starting to do more digitization. But it definitely is more of a product geared to people who are new to family history versus Ancestry is much more of a commitment. So I could see how uh, this really gives Ancestry a way to be out there and be picked up in the search engines by newbies who are doing their research and looking for new resources and then eventually, of course, funneling those customers into the full Ancestry product. So it makes a lot of sense from a business standpoint. Now, their press release here says this transaction will enable Ancestry.com to add a differentiated service targeted to a complementary segment of the growing family history category. We'll translate that. That means um, reaching people who are new to family history. And that is not necessarily the segment that they've been targeting. Although I think a lot of their commercial television advertising lately has been geared to um, intriguing people who maybe hadn't considered pursuing family history before to get involved. Now, Archives is owned and operated by a company called Inflection. They're here in the Silicon Valley. And um, since January of 2010, the site has, of course, rapidly grown to more than 380,000 paying subscribers, according to their press release. And they pay about $39.95 a year. Archives boasts access to 2.1 billion historical records, including birth records, obituaries, immigration and passenger lists, historical newspapers, and U.S. and U.K. censuses. And of course, over the past two years, Archives has partnered with multiple well-known family history organizations um, that really have helped them build a robust collection of family history records, which again, makes them even more attractive to Ancestry. So uh, well, from what we hear, um, it looks like they're going to look separate to a certain extent, certainly as the process goes forward in terms of the acquisition. It's not a done deal yet, um, but it's just going through the, the federal regulation steps that they need to go through. Um, but it looks like archives will certainly continue to be part of the 1940 U.S. federal census project they've been partnering with the National Archives on. Uh, it, it looks like the site will continue to look separate and be a separate entity. 
But of course, the employees move under the Ancestry umbrella. So Ancestry just got a little bit bigger. And um, I think that this is probably also in response to the fact that companies like Bright Solid are moving into the U.S. market. And of course, MyHeritage just purchased World Vital Records. So it's a very dynamic time in family history records and genealogy research online. Um, Stay tuned. I'll keep you abreast of everything that's going on here on the podcast. And you can read the entire press release at my blog. I'll have a link for you in the show notes or just head to my website, genealogygems.com and click blog in the menu and you can check that out. Also, I just noticed that the Southern California Genealogical Society Jamboree, the conference, the big one, is kind of the highlight of the year. Um, It's coming up in in June of 2012, but the early bird registration ends April 30th. That's just four days away. So you'll definitely want to jump on that. And the thing to remember here is is that uh, you don't have to be researching in California or Southern California to make use of it. This is truly a national conference. And in fact, I wouldn't hesitate to say it's an international conference with their webinar extension series and live streaming that they do as well. I'll be there again this year. I believe I am scheduled to teach about five classes. Well, actually, I think I'm teaching four classes and I'm also hosting a really special session This is going to be part of the um, writers section of the conference. This happens on Thursday. And Steve Luxenberg, author of Annie's Ghosts, is going to uh, be at the conference teaching. And we are going to sit down. We're going to kick off the writers conference. First thing in the morning, uh, Steve and I will sit down and do a one-on-one session talking about the writing of Annie's Ghosts and expanding on the interview that you heard here on the podcast. Um, Steve's terrific. I'm really looking forward to get a chance to get together with him in person. And I know it's going to be a wonderful event. I mean, what a way to start off a genealogy conference is uh, to hear from someone like Steve and his story about uncovering the mystery of his aunt and his mom, and uh, the stories that he had once believed and how they changed through his research. So um, that is going to be really fun. I'm also going to be debuting some new classes, which I always I love to do. And Jamboree, of course, is the perfect place to do this. One of the new classes I'll be doing this year is 10 Ways to Add Volume to Your Family History with Video. I love video. And of course, I have a fantastic time putting together the Genealogy Gems YouTube channel, uh, where you'll find over 50 videos. But it's not just creating video. It's actually researching and finding historical context to add to your family history through existing video, and where you can find that on the internet and how you can make great use of it. We're also going to do something really fun, the Google Earth scavenger hunt. Um, It's going to be fascinating family history fun. That's going to happen on Saturday. This is going to be incorporating Google Earth for genealogy and using the family history tour to have kind of our own live genealogy game show. Who knows, maybe you will be grabbed out of the audience (laughs) to participate. I launched this at the Utah Genealogical Association conference uh, in March. It was a big hit, and I am really looking forward to doing it for a large audience there at the Southern California Genealogical Society Jamboree. In addition to those two, I'm also going to be doing Sharing the Joy, projects that will captivate the non-genealogists in your life. Of course, also common surname Google search strategies. This is the class I think applies to almost everybody. Either you have a name that is very common, or you have a name that kind of doubles as a very common word in the English language. We're going to tackle that problem, and we're going to solve it and give you some tools that you can use that will really nail that down for you. So lots of things to look forward to. And I can't wait because I just bought my ticket for, it's a Friday night event that they're going to do. Now, the theme is Lights, Camera, Ancestors. Spotlight on Family History. So, of course, my video class is going to fit right in there. But they're kind of doing an Oscar theme uh, to this year's Jamboree, which, of course, makes a lot of sense. It's being held in Burbank, just down the road from Hollywood. And on Friday night, they're going to have a very special event. In fact, I'm heading to the website right here. I'm going to click on Special Events at the Jamboree website. And on Friday night, let's see here. Oh, gosh, there's so many things going on. The Hollywood Gala, sponsored by Ancestry.com, 
Travel back in time with us to Hollywood's glory days, it says. Red carpet, walk of fame stars, paparazzi, lights, camera, and ancestors. Tiara's not required, but welcome. (laughs) Dress up, dress down, it's up to you. Be sure to bring a big smile to the photo booth, which is going to be sponsored by Family Tree DNA. And that's from 6.30 to 9 o'clock on Friday night. I'm going to be there. This is my chance. I'm getting dolled up. (laughs) I got to find one of my uh, gowns and do the red carpet thing. That's just going to be so much fun. I really hope to see you there. And they have all kinds of special breakfasts and lunches and other events. Kurt Witcher is going to be doing the War of 1812 breakfast on Saturday morning from 7.30 to 9 a.m. That day also at 12.30, from 12.30 to 2, they're going to have lunch in the tent, the story of Hollywood and illustrated history with Gregory Paul Williams. So a glittering event. It's going to be a lot of fun. Boy, if, if you don't get to any other conference this year, I think Jamboree is one that you're definitely one going to go to. They're going to have, again, their Jamboree mobile app, which keeps you abreast of everything going on, helps you get all organized, and you can follow along throughout the entire weekend using your app. I love it. And there'll be lots of door prizes every year there are. And this year, I'm going to be, again, donating a one-year membership to Genealogy Gems Premium Membership. Who knows? Maybe you'll get lucky and uh, win a couple of prizes. They have so many. It's amazing. So head on over to scgsgenealogy.com and click on Jamboree. It is going to be an amazing event. Lots of fun. And there truly is something for everybody. Whether you are new, intermediate, you're advanced, you're young, you're a writer, you're into the technology track, whatever it is, it's all there. And I would recommend uh, once you get your early bird registration to get on over there and book your hotel right away. Because I did hear that the uh, the hotel right there at the event is booking up very quickly and some of the surrounding ones as well. So um, hope to see you there and stop on by the exhibit hall because I will be there when I'm not teaching and would love to uh, say hi and chat. Okay, well, I think between ancestry uh, acquiring archives.com and Jamboree, the early bird registration wrapping up. I think that's it for the news. <laughs> you've got a lot to do. And next, I'm going to hear what you've been up to. We will do that at the mailbox. From my old hometown One with some jokes From my old pal Jim Brown Bring me a letter From that girl of mine Saying that she's longing for me All the time Bring me a letter From my proud old dad that we are winning and I bet he's glad but more than any other a line from my old mother bring me a letter from my hometown Okay, well, I can't think of a better email to start off the mailbox with than this one from Ashley. And she says, I want to drop you a note to express my deepest thanks to all of the work that you put into the podcast. I'm just shy of 30 years old, and I've been working on my family tree since I was about 15. But even after all that work, I'm still learning something new every day. I found your podcast by chance one day when I was browsing the iTunes store, and I'm so glad that I did. I listened to a few of your more recent ones, then jumped right in and downloaded all of the back shows. I'm listening to the back episodes, both from your Genealogy Gems podcast and the Family History Genealogy Made Easy podcast. What I wanted to share with you is that I just finished listening to episode 20 of the Family History Genealogy Made Easy podcast all about the genealogical proof standard and, of course, the importance of sourcing, and my own sad tale with sources. Like I said, I started family tree research when I was about 15. I stumbled on a four-page report that my grandmother had ordered through a professional genealogist in the 1970s and was immediately hooked. Unfortunately, 
nothing is sourced in that report. Ah, we feel your pain, Ashley. (laughs) She says, I asked my grandma about it, and she told me that even she had found some errors. For example, she had four older half-siblings that were stillborn or died shortly after birth. The report said that they were all born and died in February, which my grandmother adamantly claims isn't true. But I based almost my entire tree on that report. Then I made things worse by accepting any family trees on Ancestry.com as fact, adding names, dates, and and information willy-nilly from people who may or may not have been related to me. It wasn't until I realized that one branch of my tree had, in quotes, traced itself back to Julius Caesar, who was his own grandfather, according to the tree. Then I went, wait a minute, I'm starting the process now of creating a new sourced accurate tree. It's probably going to take me just as long to fill out the branches, but it will be worth it in the end. And I have you and the fantastic resources you bring to the podcast to thank. Thank you so very, very much. Your podcasts are such an invaluable tool and listening to them makes me so excited to try a new method in my own research. Well, Ashley, thank you. You are not alone. Um, So many of us have come across the same thing and we still do every day. You know, you can't help it. You go on to Ancestry and you look at the family trees and there are some gems in there and there is just some garbage. So, um, boy, if we make sure that we are sourcing each piece of data, no matter where it comes from, then we know we're in good shape before we add that to our precious tree. So (laughs) thank you so much um, for writing and sharing your experience. I am so glad that you found the podcast. I let's see here. This next email is from Jack in Newport News, Virginia, who wants to know what to do with the folks who may or may not be ancestors. He writes, Lisa, I ran across the Genealogy Gems podcast while on a fishing expedition in the iTunes store, and I'm glad I did. Like so many others, I'm now playing catch up on back episodes of both that podcast, plus the family history one. I found both series informative and enjoyable. As I still have many back episodes to go through, you may have already answered this question that I'm about to pose. If so, point me to that episode. We are all searching for the right, in quotation marks, people, but sometimes we find or seemingly find the wrong people. With the massive number of records online these days, it seems quite easy to find someone with the right name and the age range and often even close to the right area. Sometimes I can eliminate a find based on some fact, but often there's less certainty. What is the suggested practice for handling a wrong or possibly wrong person or fact? Should I enter this possibly wrong person as a non-attached person in my database and explain my beliefs and doubts in that person's notes? Or is it more commonly handled by including notes in the record of the right person, explaining my doubts or reasons for exclusion of the wrong person or record? Well, Jack, like Ashley, you've got a question that we really all can relate to. It's a very good question. And in the end, I think it really comes down to two things. Number one, what works best for you? And number two, whatever you decide to do, however you decide to handle it, do it consistently. Now, my personal preference is to make notes in the file of the correct person. So if there is no correct person, no person that I've really identified that I feel pretty confident is the right person, uh, in my database, I will create an unknown person in that spot you know, the father of somebody, I'm going to put this as an unknown person, and start adding my finds to that profile, even if it's just in the notes section, so that it's all in one place. And it's attached to the position, if you will, that I'm trying to fill the position of, let's say, a father. Uh, If I'm trying to nail down who is the father of this person, by having an unknown person kind of keeping that spot open, I can then add all this data keep working with it and know that all of this is working towards identifying who that particular spot should be filled by. And uh, it kind of gives me a place to work from. I keep working at it. I keep making notations where I've disproved particular pieces of data. And hopefully, I can identify a proven individual who then takes that spot. And of course, it's critical, just like Ashley was talking about, to cite your sources on all data along the way whether that data turns out to be correct or not, you want to know where it came from and make sure that you'll be able to find it again. And particularly for data that isn't 
accurate. It's good to know, hey, the data that's coming from this source that I keep running into online, this is very questionable. This is not good data. And just having something in there to remind you of that is really, really helpful. So I hope that helps. Whatever you do, do what you feel comfortable doing and um, do it consistently. And I hope that helps. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. Okay, and our final question here comes from, I think it's Shally. It's C-H-A-L-L-E. I apologize if I'm not saying this correctly. But uh, she says, I've been listening to your podcast for a while and use many of your tips. My question for you is, I have found two books where someone has researched the family history related to my ancestral line. I've incorporated the information found into my tree, as in both cases there are source documents. I did find a few errors, but I attribute that to the time that the research was done without the digital age or the researcher was given the wrong information by someone that was not in my line. However, these two books are no longer printed. Now, in one case, the author has passed away. What does one do to get the information out to the next generation that might not have access to these books? How do you continue to work without reinventing the wheel for all the research that they did? How do you make corrections if needed? I'm concerned that the information will be lost, and I'm unsure about what to do about it. Well, for your question, I turned to my friend and book publisher, Leland Meitzler of Family Roots Publishing, and uh, I knew that he would have some good information on this, and here's what he said. He says, this is an ongoing conundrum and a question that's not easily answered. The bottom line is that a person should contact the next of kin, and attempt to buy the copyright, or at least the publication rights, just as a publisher would do. And of course, it needs to be in writing. Failing that, use the data within a succeeding publication, being very careful to obtain and cite the original sources. And if those are not available, cite the book and the author without copying word for word what they published. Honestly, Leland says it's tricky and not something I'd want to attempt. (laughs) If the book was published prior to 1923, all this is not an issue. The item is in the public domain. If published after that date, but before 1978, then there's still a good chance that the book might be out of copyright if the author didn't renew the copyright. After January 1st of 1978, the copyright is good for the author's lifetime, plus 70 years. And actually, it's even more complicated than that, But that's the basics. And uh, Leland recommends Carmack's Guide to Copyright and Contracts by Sharon DiBartolo Carmack. And I'll have a link to that in the show notes for you. And you can learn more about Leland Meitzler and Family Roots Publishing at familyrootspublishing.com, where you'll find lots of wonderful genealogy resources. So I hope that helps. Maybe you'll be lucky and those books are prior to 1923. But either way, I wish you the very best of success. Okay, well, coming up next, I've got a conversation with a good friend of mine, Jana Broglin. I met up with Jana at the Ohio Genealogical Society Conference, and she has a very unique record group to talk to us about. That's coming up right after this. It's here, the new version 5 of the award-winning Roots Magic genealogy software. It makes researching, organizing, and sharing your family history easier and more enjoyable than ever. If you're looking to take the next step in your family history research and start recording your family tree in your own genealogy database, or if you've really been wanting to make a switch to a much more user-friendly program, then do what I did. I chose Roots Magic and I'm really glad that I did. 
Throughout its 10-year history, Roots Magic has helped people research and share their family trees with innovative features like uh, moving people from one file to another with your mouse, a source wizard to help you document your work, creating a shareable CD to give to family and friends, and running Roots Magic off of a USB flash drive when you're away from home. Roots Magic also received the award for easiest to sync from Family Search for their work in interfacing with that system. Really, what are you waiting for? Download your risk-free trial of Roots Magic 5 at rootsmagic.com. See why professionals and beginners alike choose Roots Magic at rootsmagic.com. Well, here at the Ohio Genealogical Society Conference, I get a chance to, to, to talk with some of my friends and people that I see out and about online and I know are here presenting, and this is my chance to kind of pull them aside. And of course, one of my favorites is Jenna Broglin, and she is here to talk to us about some of the presentations that she's been doing. Welcome back to the show, Jenna. Hi, Lisa. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for asking me. Oh, absolutely. Wouldn't miss it because uh, this is this is a wonderful conference. You've just got people roaring around and getting into all these classes. The exhibit hall is full as usual. And it's amazing to me because I know you were busy not only putting this together, but you're in classes teaching as well. How do you do it all? Um, I think insanity is uh, stamped on my forehead. Uh, it's a rewarding, though, to see the number of people that are enjoying it, to hear the compliments about what a phenomenal venue that we have, and the hotel is great. They have just been working with us so much, and the rooms are nice, and, and we have wonderful volunteers, everybody from registration to exhibit hall, vendor chair, uh, the conference chair, my cohort has co-program chair, and we all work together so very, very well. And, and even the registration booklets and, it's, and getting the things online, it's just it's a team effort to put something like this together. And I just hope everybody has as much fun as we do. <laughs> well, I know I have been having a wonderful time. And I, you know, I love conferences because I get to come and meet listeners in person mm -hmm. and get to teach in person, which is fun. And you've been teaching on, of course, one of my favorite topics, which is the census. And it's something about the DDD. you got to tell us what the DDD is. Well, that's one of the, you know, we look at um, using the census so much, yet none of us really look at the other types of census available. There's the special census, the you know, agricultural and manufacturers and mortality schedules and the 1890 veteran schedules, but there's one that is called the DDD. It's defective, dependent, and delinquent. So it's referred to as DDD. The technical name is supplemental schedules one through seven. Interesting. So there's various schedules. And it's, it's interesting because of a, a book that we talked about here on the podcast a couple months ago called Annie's Ghosts. And uh, Steve Luxembourg was talking about researching an aunt and, and that she was in a uh, mental institution back in the 40s. Mm -hmm. And, you know, how did people get enumerated? How did they get counted? And how did they end up in the census? Is, is that what we're kind of talking about here? A little bit. This was only done in 1880. Oh, so there's only one year. And what we cover are the insane, idiots, deaf mutes, blind, homeless children, prisoners, and the pauper and indigent. And please understand, this is how it was enumerated. This is the terminology of the time. And when we look at the 1880 federal census, and you start looking across the lines, you'll see little hash marks, like might be idiot, or it might be insane, or blind. So then you want to go to the corresponding DDD and find the individual there. And it has the page and line number so you can refer back to the reg regular 1880 schedule. So they were enumerated in the population census, yes. but they're also recorded in this secondary one. Exactly. Now, before you go further on that, 
I'm interested to know, was this sort of a result of its post-Civil War? Why did it occur in 1880, do you think? I don't know exactly why they only did it in 1880, but it's more, if you look at the categories, every one of these is somebody that would have received federal or, or state assistance. More dependent, yeah. Exactly, they're dependent, whether it's... Um, a person who is insane and in a state hospital. Who's paying for their care? Are they right. private pay? Are they state pay? If they're uh, considered blind, are they self-sufficient? Or do they have to be institutionalized? And then again, who pays for it? Mm -hmm. So to me, it is appearing more like a statistical, even though the people are named right. in the census, in the, in the schedules. And the thing that, I, that is so amazing about it is, okay, let's say the person is judged to be insane, okay? It will tell if they're in an institution, if they're a pay patient or not. It will tell the form of illness. It can be melancholy. Mm, right. They can be epileptic but they'll be in insane asylum mm -hmm. because they didn't it have It was far treatment. more broad back then, wasn't it? It's not yes. like the definitive psychological, no. psychiatric type of diagnosis we get today. Exactly, because the things that they were being institutionalized for can actually be treated now medically. Yeah. And so you don't have this. Uh, the t duration of the attack, the total number of attacks, if the person had to be kept, kept in a cell, mm -hmm. if they had to be restrained, by mechanical appliances. And then it asks if they're epileptic, suicidal, or homicidal. Wow. So you, if you find somebody who has this mark, uh, you know, in the 1880 census of insane, then do try to find them. Now, it doesn't, the 1880 DDD does not exist for all states. So you're going to have mm -hmm. to look and see if you're lucky enough to find it for you. Um, Do you think that they marked them that way in the population census? It's just that there wasn't a another schedule to go look at. Were they always marking it in all states? Yes, okay. it was marked in all states, but the the schedule might not be extant. Yeah. So okay. you know, kind of have to deal with that. Even the enumerator had special things, and you had to ask the form of insanity, whether they were manic, uh, melancholia, general paralysis, dementia, epilepsy, or dipsomania. No, I don't know that one. Um, they must if, have been talking to the physicians then. I mean, I mean, can you imagine having to sit down and I guess go through the admissions or something? Exactly. If they recover and become insane again. And even um, to determine the proportion of insane who cannot be trusted with personal freedom. Wow. And so we have examples, you know, with this Mary Rice out of... Um, Fulton County, Ohio, and she, her first attack was at the age of 16. She was melancholic. Mm. It was just sad, morose. Um, she had been in a Northwestern Ohio institution for five months, and then it told her release date in 1880. And idiots, they actually measured the size of your head. They oh thought gosh. it made a difference, right. you know, if right. you had a large or small head. Uh, but it did ask if you were in a training school. So you might even get the name of that. We have one gentleman in here in a, in a county, and he is listed as idiotic. Yet he is a farmer and is married and has children. Uh, he suffered from a blow to the head when he was eight years old. Wow. But he was still totally self-sufficient. So there's a lot of things that you can find. And it said that he had a small head. I love it. And it had marked insane, but they had crossed it out, and he did not appear in any of the... Uh, registers for insanity. Well, that's interesting because it, you would guess that a person like that would be on his farm being enumerated. So is that the enumerators taking his word? Oh, yeah, he's yeah. an idiot and marking it down? Or Yeah, yeah. It, you don't know who's giving the information, whether yeah. this gentleman actually did or whether the enumerator, no, yeah, I know, I know here. Joe here, yeah. uh, or the qualifications. And sometimes they had to actually have a doctor. Uh, here's one of a gentleman who was a scribe. And he was a deaf mute, mm -hmm. but he was a, listed as scribe, and he was self-supporting. So it didn't, and he was um, inflammation in the head, and it uh, ended up with being semi-mute and semi-deaf. So he could speak somewhat. He had learned language, 
and then lost, you know, wasn't able to communicate right. as well. And semi-deaf meant that he could hear loud sounds. So this might fall under, what is that, the defective category? Mm -hmm. So thinking about the kinds of people who yeah. might fall under these and there's the heading of each one of these, so you would have a heading whether you're looking at the idiots or the insane or the deaf mutes or paupers, or whatever. So, and you find the children's home. Um, one of them here is a deaf mute since birth, and they're all listed at a school in Columbus, Columbus at school. And other ones are still within the household. So it depends on whether, you know, whether they are sent to school to learn. So it, it, everything is so fascinating. And again, blind and special notes that they had. And here was a lady who was, <laughs> she was 42 years old, keeping house, and she's blind. And she was 40 years old when the blindness occurred. And the, the cause of blindness, Lisa, are you ready? Exposure or hard work. <laughs> So I think that, I th you know, it's like, uh, I'm going to lower my, expectations a little bit. <laughs> I, I think I can tell my hubby, oh, well, I can't clean house today because I don't want to go blind. But, you know, the, it was very odd, some of the, the things that you would find as far as the causes right. of, of whether blindness or illness. And it's, it's sad to look at the, the, you know, commentary or the, you know, the ones that get me naturally are the, uh, homeless children. And they asked if the parent, either the father or mother was dead or if they were abandoned, surrendered control to the institution if they're illegitimate. Now that can be a clue because then it gives you a chance to start looking at other records. Okay, so if, if how would that child appear in the population? How Is he there just appear. one column with a, check, a tick mark that he covers would, all of this? Actually, he would appear in the home as a resident of the, ch the children's home. And then what would be the indicator to go then look at the DDD? It would have a click. And there's just yeah. one column? Yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. So it's like if he's living uh, separated from the mother, if he's ever been arrested, convicted, if the origin of the child is respectable. Um, and it's you know, saying basically that you can be in a home and not a resident of that state or county. So again, it's trying to find out pay. How much is the state paying for these people who are wards of the state? Mm -hmm. And I imagine too that they may have been looking at what else the state might want to be doing. What would it cost mm -hmm. considering how many people this might impact? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. If we look here at the inhabitants in prison, it tells if they're in a state penitentiary, a county, a jail, a workhouse, if they're awaiting trial, if they're serving out a fine, um, held as a witness if imprisoned for insanity, the date of incarceration, the number of days in the jail, and even if the labor was contracted out. If they weren't violent, you could hire out the prisoners. Right. So, you know, they could even do some of the work. That's a lot of detail. It's a lot of detail, and I think that's one of the things that we don't look at. And with my family, I think I really start better looking at them in jail and see if I can find some more. But it's, uh, you know, the paupers or the indigenous, indigent, I'm so sorry. But there's so many things too. And, and then when you start looking at like the Danvers State Hospital in Danvers, Massachusetts, it was constructed between 1874 and 88 and closed in 1902. It was built to hold 450 people, but at times had over 2,000 residents. Oh my gosh. Yeah, and I mean, you start looking at this and the conditions, and if you find that your ancestor would be, say, at Danvers, then start looking and find out the treatments. Mm -hmm. What did they do? What was their life like? And I think one of the things that I am always so um, trying to impart to the people who come to my sessions is don't just stop at the names and dates. Don't just stop, okay, I found them in the census. If you find something, especially 1880, that has any of these little click marks, follow through and find out about the person. And you might find, too, in some of the states, uh, such as Ohio, that records for mental health are closed. Yet, if you look at these records, they can give you information about the person that you have no other way of accessing. That, yeah. And these are federal records. These are open. These are federal records. Exactly. And it's not, I mean, 1880, these people are deceased, mm -hmm. and their children are deceased. You know, so we're not... We're not um, peeking into somebody's life when they're still living.
you know, yeah. it's not that. And but it's still a win, you know, it's a window as to what it was like at that time. I think we forget to look at that. You know, I, well, and we personally, I know, you know, each of us would never want to be summarized by a tick mark. Exactly. Can you imagine? You know, so how wonderful that there's another place to go. In fact, I can think of one person uh, in our family tree that maybe I need to go back and double check and then see if I can't locate those records. I think that's the whole thing. And one of the things, too, that we don't think about is this for homeless children. Right. Because I found for one of my own families, and it was the nephew, whatever, and it was this little boy, and he shows up in a child. I find him in the children's home in my county. And under it, it said, removed to the Wanderer's Home for Children in Boston, Massachusetts. So I looked in Massachusetts in the DDD, trying to locate him. I couldn't find him, but then I was able to find the Wanderer's Home for Children. Yeah. And here, Eugene Hamp is listed. The next time I find him, he said that he, you know, the information given that he was born in Ohio because he was a small child, roughly five or six years old. So the next time I find him, 10 years later, or 20 years, actually, because there's no 1890, right. I then find him in Michigan. And he's roughly 25, 26 years old. The name is unusual, Eugene Hamp, H-A-M-P. I next find him out in the state of Oregon okay. as an adult. And by then, he's giving his place of birth as Massachusetts. Oh. Because he was too young to remember right. that he was born in Ohio. So I'm finding this young child in Massachusetts who ends up in Michigan. So now I'm wondering, how? So now I'm wondering, is this orphan train? Mm. So that leads to a whole other thing. You know, mm -hmm. what, where, why did he get... From Massachusetts there, and he still retains the name of Hamp. He hasn't been adopted. And it would be really easy to find him in a 1900 census and think, oh, this must not be him because he's, it's Massachusetts. That's it's nothing like Ohio. And, and not realizing if you don't follow that trail, there might be a very logical reason for it. I think one of the things that we have to forget is this reasonably exhaustive research. Right which we have to do. All of us as a researcher need to look at this. And if you find something like that, that should be that little light bulb going off, ah, I need to check another source. I need to find out how did he get there. How did, that inf how did he go from Ohio to Massachusetts? And how did that information, how did you find out that that was that person? So then you go back to the original county, which at this time was Fulton in Ohio and look at the records there and that was the clue that he was sent to Boston yeah don't want to just skim the surface because you're you're we're missing too much of the picture that way it, it takes uh, that extra time like you say to be more exhaustive and, uh, and and I'm with you I'm all about fleshing out the stories I mean what a captivating story mm -hmm. that's a lot of travel for a long time ago you know, before there were cars and planes, and here's this gentleman all over the country. Yeah, and who took him to Boston? Right. How did he get to and Boston? So young. Oh yeah, it, in the county home records, it said that he is of tender years, you know, being five years old, and it then proceeded to go on and tell all about his family, and, you know, the mother leaving a, leading a disreputable life, and his grandfather of the state penitentiary of Ohio, which excited me because that was my guy. <laughs> yeah. But it's like, here's this little boy who's Surviving. basically abandoned by his parents. Yeah. And his father took off and thought was to be hung by, as a horse thief in, Ma in Missouri, which we found out later he wasn't because he came back to visit. But it was, you know, all the stories that went along with it. And then here's this sad little boy who kind of got lost in the you know, lost in life, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder, what kind of, how did Eugene end up? How, what kind of life did he end up having when he was in Oregon? Hopefully it was a lot better than, you know, being of tender years. Yes. But it, the, the thing with it, this 1880 is there are so many things to check and so many things to learn. And even if you find something on here that has a click mark and might show you that he was blind or partially blind, it, but then it says he's self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. You know, he, look what he has accomplished, especially in that time frame. So where do we look? We see the check mark on the population uh, enumeration. 
how do we get to ADDD? One of your main things is you're going, I would suggest, first of all, looking at Ancestry.com and seeing if they happen to have it. I would also suggest checking in the major libraries in your area. So for since we're doing this in Cleveland, I su- highly suggest checking uh, the Western Reserve Historical Society. See what they have there. Uh, for Ohio, naturally, the Hamilton County, Cincinnati. Right. And if you're in the Midwest, you've got that little library over there in Indiana, <laughs> uh, the Allen County Public Library in Fort Wayne, and see what they have. Uh, actually, you can do a search like on WorldCat and try to find out what has it. And naturally, you've got to check the Family History Library, the catalog there, and see what they might have already filmed. So you might, at at, um, the last resort, you could certainly order it through your local Family History Center, get Mm -hmm. that microfilm brought into your uh, vicinity so you can sit down on a reader and really go through it yourself. yeah, exactly. And some of them, you will find that entire townships have nothing, have nobody listed. Yeah, and right. other ones might have one person listed. Or when I was looking at some of the things in Cincinnati, for the children's homes, it would be page after page after page. But then for blind, it might have two. Mm. You, know, it's, you wow. don't know what you're going to find. Right. You just you don't know. But it's fascinating because I do. so many of us are aware of the federal population schedules. They're not that familiar with the special census and then when you start looking at the special, you tend to overlook this dependent, delinquent, defective. Defective. That's why I call it the DDD, Lisa. <laughs> well, what led you to it? Well, how did you end up getting interested in and in presenting a pres- uh, seminar on it? Eugene Hamp, mm-hmm. my ancestor, or the, the cousin. Yeah. And he had me kind of fascinated. And then I was doing the research for the one on the special census, and it came up about this, uh, the DDD, and I thought... I need to look at it. I need to find out what this is. And the more I looked at it, the more intrigued I got. And it's like, I need to find out more about this and be able to let other people know it's out there because we don't realize it. Just like the agricultural that I love. You know, there's so many things out there that you need to check. And just don't stop with the birth, death, and marriage. Our lives are so much more than that just so much more. So find out whether through the special census, if it leads you to the DDD, examine it and really go over it and then learn about the history, learn about the times, learn about maybe the treatments. It's going to put your ancestor into a whole different light. Exactly. Into a full picture. How exciting. I know your students have loved your classes and and this idea that you really bring them to discovering the entire picture. I'm so glad that you brought it to us here on the show. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. I was so thrilled when you contacted me to do this and I hope you are enjoying our conference. And one of the things that if I may add is that for your listeners out there, you might be thinking that, oh, there's so many things online and so many things that you can do at home in your bunny slippers. But really, I, I encourage you to go to local genealogical society meetings. Uh, you might not have an ancestor who ever lived there, but the tidbits and tips that you can learn on research can help you. And definitely conferences. It, the networking, the um, listening, even if you think you know about a subject, that presenter might have a different slant on it and give you some other ideas and one of my favorite places is the vendor hall yes. <laughs> but it's you know please come come to a local conference or even a one-day seminar that might be hosted by an area genealogical society become familiar with the different things because we can always learn more Absolutely. And you can learn from not even beyond your own local society but going and checking out the societies in the areas where your ancestors are from. It's interesting. It's no longer about the physical boundaries anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, even all the information I've been seeing here at the, at the Ohio Genealogical Society Conference goes well beyond Ohio. So there's always something to learn, and I absolutely agree. I don't think there'll be anything that, that ever replaces it. There's something about coming here and connecting in person that's just tremendous. I think one of the things is the excitement. 
Yeah. You're about, very contagious. It is, it's <laughs> contagious, and not only that, but you're around a whole bunch of other people who are just as goofy as you are. And, and, yeah. and enjoy and have the passion for this hobby or business, as it could be. Um, walking around the vendor hall, and I see books on Pennsylvania. Which is, you know, boy, they came, if you're in northeastern Ohio, they came through Pennsylvania right. or New York. And there's books here. And there's books on uh, Slavic because of the high population here in the Cleveland area. So you can come here and, and you go online, you look at the registration, the, who's going to be here speaking. Uh, wow, that topic sounds really, whoa, there's another one I want to go to. Ooh, look at this one. And invariably, they'll end up at the, all at the same time. So, that, <laughs> so that's when you are very fortunate to have uh, companies that come in and record so right. that you are able to get that and you use it with your syllabus and you're able to learn all over again. Exactly. Make it a year-round educational opportunity. Exactly. Oh, exactly. Wonderful. Well said. Jana Broglin, thank you so much. And thank you, Lisa. Thanks so much for joining me for this episode. I hope that you found some gems in there, things that you might be dealing with, as many of our listeners are. And uh, of course, thanks so much to Jana Broglin for joining us here on the show. Um, she is so knowledgeable, and I'm always, always so grateful that she uh, shares her knowledge with us here on the podcast. If you have any questions or comments, or you want to share a little gem that you have found, I hope that you will drop me an email at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com. Or you can leave a voicemail on the voicemail line. I can play it right here on the show. 925-272-4021. Thank you so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon.